George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. On March 28th, Syracuse University will be interrogating the racial wealth gap. It's through a program designed by the Lender Center for Social Justice. And we are here with some folk from the Lender Center who will help us to understand how they want this conference to go and why they want you to be there. So here we go. Kendall Phillips, Dr. Kendall Phillips is the interim director of the Lender Center for Social Justice at Syracuse University. And we are also here with two postdoctoral fellows, Mauricio, Dr. Mauricio Mercado is also here, and Dr. Jay Coley is also here. Now, no more doctors. It's Kendall, Mauricio, and Jay, and we're going to have this conversation. So Kendall and I, of course, go way back uh, through our conversations about horror and what horror means. Uh, and and we could that's a whole nother show actually because <laughs> um uh from what i'm this week we had some electoral news which is more, more like a horror show but there's a whole nother topic another time but uh kendall talk to me about uh your professor uh, at syracuse tell me about the lender center and your new role certainly we know you from your role at vpa visual and performing arts and the work that you've done there uh and the books you've written uh, and you help us to relate uh, how horror informs us uh, in contemporary times and what it's saying about the times we live in. That aside, tell me about this work with the Lender Center. Okay. <laughs> well, first, George, <laughs> thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. So with an entirely different hat from the way we normally talk about, uh, the Lender Center for Social Justice was founded in 2018. Uh, thanks to a very generous gift by two amazing Syracuse University alums, um, Helene and Marvin Lender, uh, it's dedicated to being proactive, innovative, interdisciplinary approaches to all kinds of social justice issues. But why we're here today is that we were fortunate to receive a very generous grant from the MetLife Foundation mm -hmm. um, to help us focus over the next three years on the racial wealth gap. And we're trying to look at that in a lot of different aspects, obviously things like money and labor and housing, but also things like healthcare and arts and culture and access to education. And so that's the great, we've got 14 different teams of researchers on campus. And we also have two amazing postdoctoral fellows who've joined us to bring their expertise to help us think about how not only can we understand the racial wealth gap in the country and in here in Syracuse, but what can we do about it? How do we close that gap? I love that there is gonna be a focus on Syracuse uh, because obviously we know that we have some of the highest concentrated poverty per capita, especially in black and brown communities. Uh, and my, by perception, we have two black and brown folks here. So, you know, by perception, I don't know who, who, how y'all identify, but that's what I perceive. So let me start with you, Jay. Um, what, why is this an important issue for you and what is your area of research? Absolutely. So thank you again for having us. I'm a sociologist by training. I'm originally from Rochester, uh, finished my PhD in Buffalo, and now I'm at Syracuse. So I'm hitting up all the three. Oh, you're just going to do your three. stops. Right? That's basically <laughs> what I'm doing. So the same thing that, you know, Syracuse is experiencing with like concentrated poverty, um, high rates of childhood poverty, Buffalo is experiencing those things as well. Um, I am an I am an urban sociologist. I study housing. Um, more specifically, I study Black neighborhoods that are experiencing gentrification. And for um, my project at the Lender Center, I'm basically examining how federal housing policy, historic policies like the Housing Act of 1949 and others have left Black people unable to access wealth in the same ways like by buying homes and building wealth, those kind of ways. So Black communities have kind of gotten a delayed start or have been denied altogether um, in that way to be able to, to build wealth. So my research just kind of examines how gentrification further threatens Black people's ability to build wealth um, through housing and owning their home. Um, and you mentioned the Housing Act of 1949. Yes. And, and, then, and, I, and if I understood you to say, it was a barrier. Um, and if, if I'm also interpreting what you said, was that yeah. supposed to be a, a tool to help home, own, home ownership in this country? Okay, so, right. yeah, so, so, so intuitively, yes. mm -hmm. why would something that would be designed mm -hmm. to help home ownership in this country also be a barrier for Black folk? 
because they outright excluded Black people from being able to reap those same benefits. We think Damn. about things like the GI Bill um, that helped uh, people coming back from war be able to buy homes and things like that. Black people were excluded from being able to benefit those things. So you have families of white people who are able to own homes since like the 40s. They're building up this wealth. Everybody's owning homes. And then you have some people who haven't, who've have never been able to own a home or they've been delayed. And we all know that Black people, when it comes to funding and loans and things like that they're more likely to get high interest rates or subprime loans. So all those things matter and in, in affect Black communities' build, ability to build wealth through home ownership. Yeah, and thank you for explaining that, Jay. And I think it's funny because uh, we might think that we know that or, well, no, let me reframe that. Basically, you said it was systemic, right? Mm -hmm. This was yes. built into the cake of Absolutely. our system. And this is, you know, can I just have a free moment here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you know what? Because I'm just going to make a statement and you guys could shoot me down if you want. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. we have a conversation? All right, listen. This is why in this current political, I'm going to go political for a moment. This is why in this current political climate, when, and this is true, that if we elect certain people, we are looking at a threat to democracy, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm receiving when I hear that, I don't know about that message because then I said, well, you know what? What is the, has democracy ever really been about protecting my rights as mm -hmm. an African American? So like I'm thinking yeah. of that, so I'm saying, I don't know if that message is gonna resonate mm -hmm. when I think about how the system hasn't always protected the interests of black folk. So telling us that this is about saving democracy, yeah. We're like, mm, well, uh, mm, um, mm, sorry. Mm -hmm. So shoot me down or say, I understand why you would think that or express that or understand that. Help, help a brother out. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely understand why you would say that because some of my research also deals with trust and mistrust um, mm -hmm. in Black communities because we know that we haven't really had that same access to democracy or right. we haven't had those you know, America is the best country in the world, but like that, the access to those things that make it, you know, this country has kind of been denied to black people and other people of color. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely understand the mistrust or being like, well, exactly who is this for? And that kind of thing comes up in my own research um, with black communities in Buffalo and other places. Yeah, and 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 I, I'll give you a quick example of that, Mauricio, and I'm coming to you. Just give me one second. Recently, um, the... So this whole idea of the re the eighty one y'all heard you heard yes. about it? hey mm -hmm. do I need to even explain that y'all know what I'm talking about no. with eighty one <laughs> right yes. they uh as well, not eighty one but the but the uh housing right they were mm -hmm. going to they were supposed to talk to the residents but instead mm -hmm. they made a deal uh or allegedly put a deal together that mm -hmm. that the residents weren't informed about mm -hmm. which also fueled the very anxieties that exactly. they had about all of the development that's happening in the uh what they call the blueprint 15 mm -hmm. and the very thing that they feared seemed to happen now you mm -hmm. you dig a little deeper and there may have been some other things and maybe mm -hmm. they weren't going to be displaced and all of those things but mm -hmm. on the surface it was kind of like here we go again right yes, uh, absolutely. yeah so mauricio tell me about your research and why this issue is important to you yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks again for, for hosting us today. I very much appreciate that. So yeah, I do research in entrepreneurship. Uh, my background is uh, I was I was born in, in, in Mexico in a border city in Mexico with, with Texas and uh, from a very young age was exposed to a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors and and I saw it as a way basically for social mobility and to to bridge gaps that were previously you know hard to hard to accomplish by other means so my research um i got my phd at iowa state university in entrepreneurship and i specifically focus on the resource acquisition habits of uh, underrepresented minority entrepreneurs so mm -hmm. how do uh, latino individuals and black individuals that want to go entrepreneur into entrepreneurship what do how, why or or how do they struggle when seeking loans? Do they get higher interest rates, which mm -hmm. we know they do, uh, to when compared to similar other profiles of non-minority individuals? Uh, do they 
face hurdles when trying to acquire equity financing, which is another form of, of financing, and, and why does that happen? So uh, basically, my research just focused on, on how does uh, race and its implications uh, reproduce the systemic inequalities that we have in the United States mm. in the context of entrepreneurship and new business creation. Yeah, it's a lot more to get to, a lot more to interrogate. I love that's an academic word. Uh, I love to, but, but Mauricio, did you, can you just say your college again? Because I missed it. Oh, uh, I was, I, I got my PhD at Iowa State University. Iowa State. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, and this, this idea around access to capital is a theme that we hear often uh, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship uh, in these communities. What are you observing there? Yes, it's very interesting, actually. I, I One of my uh, key studies here that I have is, is in a laboratory experiment well, where I talked to 375 venture capitalists mm. and I had them hear a pitch of a successfully funded company that already exists and already got funding. And all I did was I manipulated the the picture of, I told them, okay, half of them individuals, I told them this pitch was delivered by a individual of color. The other half, it was given by a white man. And just that manipulation changes the, the interpretation of trustworthiness and competence that venture capitalists have of uh, minority individuals that are entrepreneurs. Specifically, it it communicates that VCs perceive minorities as much less competent, although more trustworthy than their non-minority counterparts. And this really translates into, you have this puzzle, right? Like I'm thinking of you as more trustworthy, but I also think of you as much less competent. And just that perception of competence uh, negatively affects the entrepreneur in trying to obtain financing. They obtain much less funding than their non-minority counterparts, even though the pitch was the same, right? All I changed was was the, the skin color of the individual. And the, I mean, right there, right? And this is where it gets really interesting because we talk about, you know, racial wealth gap and you have, again, let's go back to the systems, right? We've got perceptions, we've got systems that automatically that, that are, uh, I was going to say, they're, they're built in hurdles for, for, for folks. And so I'm glad MetLife has given you three years to do this because, you know, I guess what I'm thinking, Kendall, and all of you can jump in in this round robin here. I'm thinking if we know some of these things and they have to be studied, you're all scientists, so you have to study. But these are not new things. We know these things, right? So we're going to study and prove them again. How do we, in the, how do we produce results year by year by year that not only help us understand, but also dismantle the system and tear down the system that is operating? Because we don't do that. We can study it till the, tomorrow. We gotta. So, I, I, I know that's a theory. I know that's a pie in the sky theoretical. But holler at me. Tell me what y'all thinking. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are we? What are we hoping? Well, I can say from from the lender center perspective. Again, we're very grateful to MetLife Foundation for supporting us. But you're catching exactly what we're trying to think. If you approach the racial wealth gap purely as an issue of capital and opportunity then you're missing the the fact of accumulated wealth of housing differential health care differential education uh, access to you know mental health and things so you don't see the picture so one of the things we're trying to do by bringing together these 14 different uh, research teams and the postdocs is to try to look not just at all these individual systems policies and psychologies and cultural norms and geography and education we're trying to bring them together and say, where are the points that they overlap and are there places where we can intervene? And that's the other great thing about being here at Syracuse University and in this city is we're really hoping to to engage the city to think about, are there ways we can do that here? Because one of the things I think is important for us to, to note here, you know, the city is going to be undergoing change. 
Yeah. I 81, which came from exactly the sort of thing that Jay's talking about, you know, urban renewal was supposed to build new houses and suddenly it was a hospital on a highway and, and everyone was fragmented and thrown West and South and other places. So I 81 changing is going to fundamentally change the nature of the city. The prospect of Micron coming, which could bring again, billions of dollars and lots of jobs and lots of new people. Those changes are coming. The question we're posing to ourselves and to the city leaders is how do we make sure those changes benefit the communities that have been underserved and, and, and oppressed as opposed to just being changes that continue to benefit a small percentage of the population or bring another group of white people who benefit from it while we continue to push aside and down those communities of color who have been here as the backbone of the city. And so that's part of what this March 28th event and all this great research is designed to ask. Let's talk about how, um, and, and I, I don't want to cut you off, Jay or Mauricio, if you wanted to add to what Kendall said. I was just going to say that I, I, I strongly believe that universities and medical centers owe something to the communities that they are within. Mm -hmm. um, so the intervention part is very important to me. And then like, you know, Kendall's adding the, the I-81 and things like that. And we know this is like, it's supposed to be for the better, but it's still going to have an impact on the communities um, where it's happening and things like that. So making sure that we like are engaged with our community, that we are using our resources that we can give back to our communities um, and helping them that way. So those kind of things are really important to me when I think about um, the intervention part of it. Um, Mauricio, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just to uh, echo a bit what Kendall and, and Jay were saying, I think that a part of this lender center ecosystem that we have created really allows us to have this as an interdisciplinary approach. And that's what I very much appreciate because not only are we just focusing on one aspect of, of the racial wealth gap, we're broadening it up. And that allows us for our interventions to be uh, much more effective, if I could say that. The tell us interventions that we're developing. And this is the first of many conversations, but tell us about this day on the 28th. Uh, how do how does community get involved? Do they have to register? How do they register? Is it free? What's the day of the week it's going to happen? Yeah, so this is Thursday, March 28th. We'll actually start off by uh, being having some of our folks on the Thursday morning roundtable. Some folks will know that as the Syracuse University. It's an online uh bit like this. It's a kind of talk show online. So we're going to be talking about it there. The main event will start at noon in the Whitman School of Management. It is free. Uh, there will also be a webinar component. So people can't be at Syracuse or can't make it into the Whitman School of Management, but are still interested. You can watch this on. It'll be live streaming. Um, throughout the day, we've got a series of panels from our first five teams and including the research that Jay and Maurizio are doing looking at things like uh, health and wellness, looking at public education, food and labor. We're looking at uh, community spaces and neighborhoods. Uh, we're looking at business practices. And for each of the research teams that are presenting, we've invited a community leader to come and respond. So we've invited folks from um, the county. We've invited folks from um, the Syry Syracuse City School District. We've invited folks working in the Syracuse University uh, Onondaga food systems structures. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make sure it's not just academics talking to academics, but we're asking those community respondents to come and talk about how that research impacts their day-to-day -day engagement with things like health and wellness, food, housing, et cetera. And then if that's not enough, uh, we've got what I think is a really amazing round table for the afternoon. So starting at 5.30, uh, we've got a group of, of, I think, really prominent, very important community leaders. Uh, we're going to have the Deputy Mayor, Sharon Owens, is going to join us. Uh, Robert Simmons from the Micron Foundation is going to be there. Uh, we've got uh, Melanie Littlejohn uh, from the Community Foundation and Stephanie Pasquale from the Allen Family Foundation. Again, these are some of the major philanthropic corporate governmental entities that will be there. And we're going to pose this question to them. Uh, my good colleague, Dr. Marcel Haddix, who's the uh, Associate Provost for Strategic Initiatives, she's going to moderate. And we're going to ask them to think about all the research we're doing and ask the question, how do we make sure that all these changes come to Syracuse benefit the populations that most need the help? Man, I love it. I do. 
and I love the community engagement. And the reason why these folks are here is so that you can get your foot in the door. I think that um, all the efforts that we have, I love this idea of the com- that the university is seeing itself in partnership, but also seeing at the community as its test case. Because guess what? If we can do it here, right? We used to be the test kitchen, right? So let's test out this theory and let's let's create the vision for the communities that we want and so that everybody feels like they have access to everything. All right, let's run it down. March 28th, Thursday, March 28th at noon. Is there a registration at all? There is. And if folks are interested, they can visit lendercenter.syr.edu, or you can go on the Syracuse events calendar, Syracuse University. You go to March 28th, you'll find us right there. You can click. There's a great place to register. Again, we love to know who's coming. Uh, There's also a place there to register if you want virtual access. Now, I should say the virtual access you do need to register for. We're not just going to broadcast. We don't have the broadcast capabilities that you have here, George. So if people (laughs) want to watch this or want to watch parts of it, come on, register. Tell us you want to watch it virtually. And then closer to the event, you'll get an email. It'll show you how to set up the webinar. And then you can just log in and watch it on your computer. But let us know. Register if you want. But again, if people are just available and think, I want to stop by the Whitman School of Management, we're in the fourth floor in the Milton Room, come see us. We want the community involved. Each of these panels and the community roundtable is going to have a component that is question and answer. We're we're not here to tell people in the city of Syracuse their problems. We're here to listen. We're here to work together. Lender Center for Social Justice. Lender Center. No, Lender Center. S-Y-R.edu. Did I get that right? Lendercenter.syr.edu, exactly. Center.syr.edu is how you register. We'll have that link for you here in however you're getting this program on the air, on podcast, or on YouTube. We're looking forward to seeing all of you. One burning question that I did not get answered, Mauricio. You said the border town in Mexico. What town in Mexico? Yeah, I was born in in Juarez, so it's... Border with uh, El Paso. El Paso, Texas. yes. But when you that's I, when I I was like, which one of these cities? I happened to visit El Paso, El Paso one time, and I wanted to walk across the border, but I didn't have my passport, and I was like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, Ciudad Juarez, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. There you go. See. Uh. <laughs> All right, Kendall Phillips, Mauricio Mercado, and Jay Coley. Thank you so much for joining us. Mark your calendars, folks, lendercenter.syr.edu. It is the interrogation of the racial wealth gap from various different disciplines, including input from leaders in the community at all levels. So don't say we didn't tell you. So you can register virtually or you can register to be there in person. But be there March 28th at the Lender Center. Well, it's not the Lender Center. You're going to be at the Whitman School which is where the Lender Center is. Inspiration for the nation.